idea of the liberal arts. They're obviously related. But liberal arts colleges are made in different ways. There are lots of different varieties of them. Mars Hill is definitely a liberal arts college because it fits certain criteria that we expect. That doesn't mean you have to have this to call yourself one. There are institutions out there of, uh, that are very different from what we're going to look at that say we're liberal arts. And that might mean that their curriculum is based on the liberal arts. Most universities and colleges in this country are. But essentially, you're looking at something small, less than 2,500 students. Mars Hill has between 11 and 1,200 students. This fall, we'll probably have about 1,250. They're the largest in 15 years, at least, maybe longer than that. Okay? But we're still a small institution. That matters because it matters that we have access. Faculty and students work together. This is the largest instructional space on campus. You, right now, number about three times the size of the largest class you'll have on campus. If you were at a regional comprehensive university, you'd probably have a class like this your first two semesters, something this size. Lectures like this are very uncommon at Marcel. We don't want them to be common at Marcel. We may be growing. We're not going to be a 14,000 student campus anytime soon. We don't want to be. That's not who we are. We are small. Okay? Predominantly residential. People live and work and learn together. If you're doing distance education, it's not liberal arts. If you're taking classes online, it's really not liberal arts. The idea is that you are there. You are part of the community you're learning in. Predominantly undergraduate. Marshall does have a graduate program now, has one, has an MEB in elementary education. But that's a very small percentage. About 1% of our student population are graduate students. 99 are undergrad. Uh, low student to faculty ratio, under 15 to 1. Mars Hill's student to faculty ratio is, depending on the year, between 11 and 12 to 1. The average for colleges and universities in the country is 18. Some institutions in this country are over 30. University of Central Florida, there was a newspaper report just this past week on um, the Orlando Sentinel about 30.5 to <coughs> 1. Big institutions are outgrown the size of the faculty. There's no way to really have interaction. Your faculty at the UCF just won't know you. At Mars Hill, they will. And that's part of who we are. Broad curriculum, arts, humanities, natural sciences, again, liberal arts colleges, even universities sometimes have a lot of these. But at Mars Hill, they're fundamental. All right, the curriculum. There are three parts of the curriculum of Mars Hill. First of all is general education. Everyone completes that who's an undergrad. Graduate students don't have gen ed, every undergrad does. This is the basis of being a citizen, okay? It means it's gonna be breadth, not just depth. Your major is gonna give you depth. If you're a music major, you'll learn a lot about music, but you'll also have that foundation in general education of literature and history and writing. If you're a chemistry major, you'll have the same thing. If you're an athletic training major, the same thing. Criminal justice, same thing. Everyone does gen ed. Everyone then chooses a major. It could be more than one. Okay? We do have double majors. Not a lot, but the students can do that occasionally. Minors as well. And then electives. That's everything else. And don't think that that's just underwater basket music. It's not. Okay? College students joke about that. You'll be one soon. You'll get it. Um, it's the glue that holds it together. It's all the other options. What else can we do? And don't think that, that it's not important. I just have to get enough credits to graduate. No. Actually, those electives can be very useful, but you don't necessarily know how. I had three majors when I was an undergraduate. Not at the same time. Okay? But I chose different days, and I switched back and forth. And that's okay. Many of you will do that, too. I ended up doing gen ed. I did my major in English. My last year in college, I had time for some electives. I took a political science course. The only one I ever took, Canadian government. And I took it like most everyone else did, because it was a field trip to Canada. Because you can't really do Canadian government in, say, um, four. But we got to go up there. It was a great experience. It, it underscored a lot of what I ended up doing as an English professor doing 19th century British literature, which is what I taught for many years. How? Well, I ended up thinking differently about my main topic. I was thinking about government structures. I was thinking about power. I was thinking about political uh, uh, issues. And that in some ways informed some of the questions I was asking in my own discipline. I didn't become a political scientist. And I've only been back to Canada once since then. But it was important for me to take that other course because you never know what you're going to learn in some other elective that's going to inform what you do for the rest of your life. And to think that we're going to say, have to do this gen ed and this major, and then we'll know exactly what you need to know. Ooh. There's far more to learn than you can ever learn in any set of courses you'll ever take at any institution. And in some ways, that's what the electives are for. So take advantage of those opportunities. All right. General education. You will be the first students not only admitted to Marshall University, but the first students who are going to be taking courses under the foundation 
And because Asheville is such a center of art therapy, there's a lot of people nearby who want to work with interns, who are interested in the field. Now, if you want to be an art therapist, you have to go to grad school. But it helps to have an undergrad degree in art therapy to do so. So we're the first ones out there, but the only ones in North Carolina doing that right now. Visual communication design, a new program that was uh, put together by faculty of the art in the computer science department. You would think those two go together so well. People like computer science, people like art, you think <coughs> those are completely different. Actually, at Mars Hill, those work pretty well together. History. History is just this year adding a new concentration in what's called public history. Okay, think of that as site management, working out in the field as a historian. We're working with uh, uh, local community partners to uh, provide internship opportunities for students who want to go out and not just be uh, uh, scholarly historians, but practical historians. Right? And finally, the new major that we just brought online, or we're just bringing on this semester, criminal justice. Now, this has been a program that we've had a lot of students interested in for several years, um, but we just started offering classes, specific classes, we've had a few of them, but specific CJ designated classes this semester, largest class on campus this term, intro to criminal justice. Okay? A lot of interest out there. We've got a new faculty member uh, uh, who we hired last year to do this. She was the chair of the faculty at Penn State University when she came to Mars Hill to develop a new criminal justice program. Okay? That's what's going on at Mars Hill right now. New programs, it's a quality program that we're really investing in right now. All right, back to this. So what you're going to be looking at, and Dr. Pierce will get to this in just a minute, is courses that are going to fit within these categories. Now, if you're in a particular major, you might have major courses your first semester. But for most of you, it's about trying some things and getting laying down a solid foundation. You don't build the house before you lay the foundation. Right? You've got to make sure that's solid. And that's what general education is really about, is laying down a solid foundation. All right, credits. I told you I'd get to that. Credits are also called semester hours of credit, or credit hours, or hours, or they're used interchangeably. But just know that one credit is not what it was in high school. A credit in high school, most high schools anyway, is a year in a particular area, right? Sometimes it's a semester, and you can earn two credits for the same course throughout the year. But for most, it's half a credit for the fall, and half a credit for the spring, and it's one for the whole thing. It's not the way it works in college. Okay? Because we have certain guidelines related to financial aid packages and so forth, we really have a fairly narrow definition of what credit is. 12 and a half hours in class, 25 hours outside of class, or an hour of classwork and two hours of homework per week for 15 weeks. That's a semester. That's what we use. There are certain institutions that have quarter systems and trimester systems and all sorts of other things. Notice, though, that 15 hours is 12 and a half because we're talking federal definitions in here. The federal definition of an hour of college work is 15 minutes long. Feds sometimes don't count well. Okay? <laughs> Essentially, it's in order to make sure that you have, say, you'll, when you're a college student, you get it, Joe. Uh, when you're a college student, you need 10 more minutes to get to your next class, right? And that's what the 50 minutes is really about. Think of it as a one to two ratio. For every credit you've got in class for lecture, and labs are a little bit different, but for lecture, you're expected to spend two hours outside of class. And that's what we tell the feds that we're expecting of you. That's what your faculty are expecting of you. If you've got a class that meets on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you probably get about two hours of work between those classes for that class. You might do it Monday night or Tuesday during the day, but it's really a couple of hours of work for every one of those class meetings. You need 128 of those credits to graduate, minimum. That is not maximum. It's not when you hit 128, angels sing and you walk out with a piece of belt. That's not what happens. Okay? It is that you have to have at least that, and they have to be the right ones, don't forget. You have to have completed all of general education. You have to have completed one major set of major requirements. But you should be able to do that with about 128 or so hours. That means 16 credits per semester. Okay? Two semesters, four years, you should be able to graduate on time. Full-time students, you have to have at least 12 hours where you are not eligible for financial aid. Make sure that you remember that. Okay? Most people don't forget it, but it's actually important that people have forgotten, you know what? I didn't know I had a bill. Why do I have a bill? You have a bill because you have no financial aid. I have financial aid. I've had financial aid. Yes, but you don't have 12 hours. You have to have 12 hours or you're not eligible anymore. Suddenly, Pell Grant, Stafford loans, you're no longer eligible because you're not a full-time student. Okay? It gets very complicated if you're not. You don't want to put below 12 hours. And anything up to 20, it's the same cost. The tuition rate for full-time students is between those two. Now, I mean, if you think, oh, well, I do 20 credits a semester. I can graduate early, right? In theory, yes. But it'll be like you're re-entering the atmosphere without some sort of heat shield. You just burst into flames. Okay? <laughs> you can't just do 20.
20 credits every semester and not take some damage from doing that. Unless you're a music major. Music majors, you'll, you'll develop a heat shield. Um, you will, you'll figure, you will figure out how to do that. But you don't want to shoot for that. Certainly not your first semester. If you've got some extra curricular, curricular responsibilities, if you're an athlete or you're going to be uh, involved in church work here or mission or something like that, you shouldn't be trying to do 20 hours while you're doing that too. Because 20 hours is just 20 hours of work in the classroom. It's another 40 outside. Plus whatever else you're doing. Figure out what your time potential is. And develop your course schedule to accommodate that. That doesn't mean take it easy when you're in season or anything like that. But you'd be aware that it might be an opportunity to do a little bit less. So you can do a little bit more out of season. Alright? And finally, summer school is not required. That doesn't mean people don't do it. Summer school is not part of our tuition, which means that if you do summer school, you will pay for a credit hour to do that. Okay? If you go home, you can bring credits back in. That's a possibility too. All right, schedules, what's it gonna look like? First of all, most, most of the courses you'll take are three credits. There are lab courses that are four, there are some courses that are two or even occasionally one, but most of the courses you'll take in college are gonna be three credits, at least here. That's usually how we schedule Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes. Eight, nine, 10, very easy to remember. Remember that they're 50 minutes. So even though it's the eight to nine slot, class is one at 8.50, that'll give you time to get across campus. It should not be difficult to get from one part of campus to the other in 10 minutes, okay? So Lisa Walkman, how many of you met Lisa Walkman earlier today? She was here earlier, she was down, she's about this tall. She's our director of retention. She's a very active person, but she also has very short legs. <laughs> she can make it from the stadium to Cornwall Hall under 10 minutes. If she can, I'm fairly certain you can. Okay? <laughs> it's possible to get across this campus easily at regular walking speed without breaking a sweat. Now, if you have some, some uh, uh, mobility issues, it might be a little bit more difficult. We'll work your schedule around to make sure you're not doing that. But don't worry about, I've only got 10 minutes to get to class. You should be able to make it. Uh, Tuesday, Thursday, we do 75 minute walks. Note that per week, it's 150 minutes regardless. If you're talking about uh, either three meetings or two meetings, Thing. Those are now on 50. You've got a little bit extra time on Tuesday, Thursday between classes. There are some exceptions. Labs, as I mentioned, science and math in particular. Uh, accounting, if you're a business major, you'll have a lab there. Practica, if you're in art or music or theater, there may be some courses that don't, become, don't fit into the regular schedule. Note also that Marshall has an adult and graduate studies program, AGS. Sometimes the AGS people tell, tell us that they're members of the American Goat Society. It's actually not a graduate studies. But notice that they actually schedule things differently because these are for non-traditional students. You're mostly traditional age students, if not all of you. If you are 42 years old, have already in, in a profession, have kids at home, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 o'clock is not an option. But we do offer classes on campus and elsewhere, okay, these particular sites, for students who are coming back to school after some time off. These are people who need to spend four hours at a time but can only get one night a week to do that. That is not a model that works very well for traditional students. If you're 19, 18, 19, 20 years old, four hour blocks, is that what you want to do? No break? Well, maybe a short break. It's not an easy thing to do. If that's all your options, that's a great choice. If you've got other options, Spreading it out is probably a better thing. Avoid the sections when you're a student that are labeled as A or S or O sections, because those are all our AGS sections. They're not really designed for you. They're really designed for a different audience. You just keep that in mind. All right, homework and study. There's that 16 credit semester. Let's imagine that's what you're going to be doing, which means that you get 16 hours a week in class, which means that you should be spending 32 hours a week studying. It's what you're planning right now, right? More nodding. National Survey of Student Engagement, the NESI that we do every other year here at Mars Hill is done across the country, gives us some really interesting data about what first-year students really do. How much time do you think first-year students actually spend per week studying? It's not 32, in case you're going to guess that. 15 and 20, pretty good. 14.9 hours a week is the average. But here's an interesting breakdown. How many of you think male students study more? <laughs> How do you think female students study more? You passed the first test. <laughs> female students are more committed in the classroom, or in, excuse me, outside of the classroom, in terms of how much time they, they report studying. That doesn't mean they're actually doing it. They might be better flyers on their school. We don't know exactly. It's just what they say they do. <laughs> but here's an interesting distinction. You want to do well in class? You need to study more, don't you? Now, of course.
study more than students who get Bs, who study more than students who get Cs. And you know what? It drops off a cliff when you're talking about Bs and Fs. Okay? It is the number one factor affecting student GPA, excuse me, the number two factor affecting student GPA is hours spent studying. Believe it or not, that's ahead of attendance. Okay? That doesn't mean attendance isn't important. Okay? Just because it happens to be below hours spent studying. It's about 20 different factors that have been measured. Attendance is still very, very high. But it's more important that you study than you even go to class. If you don't study and go to class, you are taking up space, but you're probably not really learning as much, are you? You need to be doing work outside of class as well as inside of class. Any guess what the number one factor is? No, not sleep. Sleep was in the top five, though. <laughs> you want to succeed? Make good choices. Okay? Alcohol consumption is the number one effect on student GPA, and it is not a positive effect, in case you were wondering. All right. Grades. Grades and Mars Hill. There is no such thing as above a 4.0 GPA. If you have had, a, if you've got a 4.2 GPA in high school, that's great. You will never see that again. Okay? It's gone. 4 is as high as it gets. In my time at Mars Hill, this is my 14th year here, I know of four traditional students who have graduated with a 4 GPA. Okay? It does not happen very often. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It does, but it's rare. Okay? Do not think that I'll just get straight A's. I got A's and B's in high school. College will be easier. Or I got A's in high school, so I'll get A's in high It's not the same thing. It is more difficult, quantitatively and qualitatively, it's different. We use this GBA, and we've got a number of other grades that are there too, that you might see occasionally, there's, there's special things. But sometimes we talk about grade inflation. We're all worried about grade inflation. Everyone's getting A's now. Well, there's some data that, 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 that uh, supports that. Nationwide, 42, this is according to 2008. In 2008, 42% of college grades were A which means that we're all exceeding expectations. Which means our expectations are too low. Except in Mars Hill. Because it doesn't actually get worn out by the data that we've got at Mars Hill. At Mars Hill, freshmen don't get 42% A's. Only 12% of freshmen actually are A's. Or 12% of grades in freshman classes are A's. Only 34 at the senior level. Okay. Now it means that, that freshmen are progressing to sophomore to junior and senior learning. Okay, it could be that there's some attrition in here, too. Students who aren't able to cut it or down at this end of the spectrum don't stick it out. They get on academic probation, they drop out. Which means that you've paid for college classes and you haven't completed the curriculum, which means you don't have the credential, which means that maybe you shouldn't have not studied. Okay? Take advantage of this opportunity afforded you. Know, though, that we respect you a heck of a lot more than the institutions that inflate grades. Because what an inflated grade is, it means that showing up is all you have to do. And if all you have to do is show up, you don't have to learn that much. We actually respect you enough to talk about the grade that you earned at Mars Hill. That doesn't mean there isn't a change over the years. There has been. Okay? There are more higher grades earned at Mars Hill now than there were. But that grade inflation tends to go on at other institutions and not here. The grade that you earn is one that you should be proud of if it's high. And one that you should know is because of what you did if it's low. All right, academic standards. What do you need to do? First of all, qualitative. What's your GPA going to be? As a freshman, if you've got fewer than 28 credits, you need to maintain a 1.5 GPA. Okay? Now, these, that's the lowest C minus. Okay? It's because we do expect that the transition between high school and college, most of you are, are first time freshmen, can be difficult. So we don't have the final standard to start off with. It starts off lower and it grows. Sophomore year, it's 1.8. Junior and senior year, it's 2.0. Remember the GPAs for grades back before? What was the GPA of a D? A one. Ds do not get degrees. Okay? If you have a D average, you're suspended. That does not mean that you can't satisfy a requirement to graduate with a D. The occasional D is not going to sink you. But if you're getting Ds regularly, it means that you're not maintaining the GPA you need to graduate. You need to be thinking of at least a 2 up or you don't graduate. If you're a freshman, you get a 1.5 overall GPA that freshman year, 
You were in good academic standing. But you shot yourself in the foot because now you've got to make up for it. Now you've got to get your GPA up even higher than you did before. Okay? Don't start here. It's there as a safety for people who are starting off. But this is the minimum. Ultimately, this is what you have to have when you don't get to graduate. On the quantitative uh, standards, how many credit hours do I have to take? Remember the 12 we talked about before? before? You have to have 12 to be full time. We do occasionally have three quarter and a half time students, but they're very rare. Okay? Very limited. And again, financial aid becomes very complicated then. You, know, you need to be thinking about at least 12 hours per semester. All right, attendance. Yes, you do need to be here. You do need to be in class. Those are the dates of the first day of class, the 27th of August, and the last day of exams for the next two semesters. Okay? Gateway orientation will begin on the 23rd of August. So new students will be coming in earlier than the 27th, a few days before classes start. If you are involved in a fall activity, if you're in the honors program, if you're a Bonner scholar, if you are a football player, if you are involved in any of the extracurriculars that begin in the fall, you might be here even earlier than the 23rd. Don't think that's going to affect your um, opportunity for getting into certain housing, anything like that. It doesn't. It does mean, though, that there will be activities for you that are going on beforehand, practice before the game, first game, or retreat for honors and honor students and so forth. Um, because we're a residential college, attendance matters. One of the things that you do by going to class is not only learn for yourself, you teach others. Right? Because when you're in that class, the question you don't think to ask that gets asked by the next person over, you learn from. Right? It's an opportunity missed if you think you just learn on your own. You don't. If you want to, you can potentially do that. But I guarantee you the cost of tuition is going to be really high into the one-to-one -one ratio. Okay? It just not doesn't work that well. And honestly, there's a certain class size below which it doesn't work very well. I've taught those classes before. You've got like three students in them. You're so dependent upon the relationship between those three people, it doesn't work so well. At the other end of the spectrum, really large classes like this, there's not enough opportunity for interaction. There's a happy middle, a happy medium. In that happy medium, you're contributing to the learning of your, your peers, and they're contributing to yours. So yes, your attendance matters. Your attendance matters also matter for financial aid. If you're not showing up for class, but you're getting financial aid, essentially you're committing federal fraud, and I don't want you to go to Leavenworth. Okay, so we need to keep, make sure that you're still in class. We also pay attention to it in terms of grade. Different instructors and departments might have their own pro, uh, uh, policies regarding grades. They'll be stated on the syllabus you receive at the beginning of the semester. Different courses will have different policies and different procedures. Know, though, that if you are involved in anything related to a college activity, in other words, if you are going on a field trip with your biology class, or you have an away game to go to, and as a result of that, you have to miss a class, that is not counted against you. That does not mean that you don't have to do the work of that day. Or you do, and you have to make it up. You have to make the arrangements, and that's really what's key. So you're responsible for communicating with the instructor if you miss a class, and for making up what goes on there. But it does, it, you will not be penalized for being involved in a college-sponsored activity. Um, the retention office, Lisa mentioned earlier, she also pays very careful attention to this. Faculty uh, uh, have communication with her on a regular basis all semester long, and they're regularly asked, is everyone there? Are you showing up? Okay. And she's the person who really does hunt people down occasionally. If you've been sick and forgotten to tell anybody, Lisa might be the one who's going to find out about it. If something's going on in your life that's making it difficult to get to class, she's the person who's going to be the first one there to ask the questions. Okay. All right. Integrity. Call it what you will. Plagiarism, cheating, copying, stealing. Thou shalt not do any of them. It is essentially the academic commandment. Okay? You are here for your education. You're not here to get grades. You're not here to get an A. You're here to learn. Now, that grade is supposed to be a representation of what you have learned. But when you focus on the grade instead of on the learning, you miss the boat. It does not help you to do that. Now, I know you've probably heard it before, and I don't expect anyone in this room is actually going to do it, but I know it does happen occasionally because people confuse the short-term with the long-term goal. They think the grade is what's important when it's the learning that that grade is supposed to represent. And sometimes, yes, the assignments can be things that you don't really want to do, and maybe you don't see the purpose of them. But know that the faculty who are giving them to you do, they might have a broader perspective, and they're wanting what you can do. And don't worry, if you can't do well, but you're doing your best, that's okay. We can work with that. If you can't do well, but you're doing somebody else's work, or somebody's doing it for you, we can't work with that. It undermines the very idea of what higher education is about. Um, there 
networks. This is a wireless classroom in here. All of the instructional sites across campus are Wi-Fi enabled, and you will have access to that during class or other times. All of the housing options on campus have Wi-Fi. The newer ones have uh, Wi-Fi access in every room. Some of the older ones in the common spaces are being rolled out to all the other spaces across campus. But there's wired access in all of those as well. If you've got an option between the two, plug in, it's faster. Okay? That cable is going to uh, get a much faster signal than the Wi-Fi network anyway. Um, computer labs and classrooms that are in Renfro, that's the library. Wallen Ferguson, which is where uh, we went earlier today. Uh, Nash and Marsh Banks. I also know that Renfro has free printing for students. Okay? So you don't have to have a printer. That's not to say it's a bad idea to get one, because it's all uh, black and white. But there is an opportunity to print your work out. And a lot of faculty will now accept email attachments of work. And we'll do it electronically as well. All right, technology recommendations. Do you need a computer? Not technically, but it's a good investment. Now I'll tell you that I had a similar talk with your, parents, your family members who were here earlier. At 10.30, I did the session over in uh, Roy Hill Chapel. I gave them the same advice I'm going to give you. It is not a bad investment. If you do not have a laptop right now, it's probably something that you should have. Okay? That doesn't mean that because you need a laptop, now you go tell them, yeah, 3,500 bucks, 17 inches, 16 gigs of RAM, it's going to play the latest, it's going to have the best operating system. Okay? That's not the case at all. You can get by quite easily with a relatively low powered and inexpensive netbook or 12 inch laptop. Remember, this is something you want to carry around. Those 17 inch, uh, 17 inch gigantic monsters are going to give you back problems. Get something light, get something you can carry around with you and you'll use it more effectively. Uh, I wouldn't invest in a desktop nowadays. Unless you're a graphic designer, you're gonna sit in one place and do your work. It's something where you need to be mobile. If you're gonna be in the arts, you're probably gonna need a Mac. If you're not, you probably don't. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have one, okay? If you happen to be on one side of this particular religious divide, you decide you're on his mind, okay? <laughs> but do know, more bang for your buck up here, expectations in certain disciplines down here, is what it comes down to. If you want a tablet, that's great for angry birds. It's probably not all that good yet for an academic purposes, okay? When I was a member of the faculty, I was the director of the honors program. Very first year was the first iPad came out. We had iPads for every student in the honors program. We had a summer reading program at that time. We had summer reading program text that was available for them. They had a Kindle app. They installed it. They had it right there. We did everything in that LAA 111, FYX 111 class, on the iPad. I found out midway through the semester that they were cheating. They bought copies of the book, and they were reading it in book form. They killed trees and I made iPads available for them. Why? Because it's really not ready for prime time for that purpose. That doesn't mean there aren't all sorts of ebook apps out there. And they can be quite useful. But if you use your highlighter on your iPad, it's not going to work very well. And while you can do some of that, it's usually not as convenient as the old-fashioned, several hundred years old technology of wood pulp and ink. Okay? Works fairly well, actually, and you already know how to use it. There's no learning curve. That said, a tablet's not a bad thing, okay? but it's not going to be something you're going to use for your primary uh, uh, purposes. Printer, an inexpensive inkjet is probably a good idea. There are going to be times when you need to print out a color uh, a table or something like that. If you want to just use it for the occasional thing you need to print out and use the black and white stuff in the library, do it. It'll look a little bit strange, but it'll be a lot less expensive. But yeah, it's probably good to have one of those. If you need one of these, and who does? Okay. And you're up for renewal, let me tell you that in Mars Hill, AT&T and T-Mobile don't work so well all the time. They're a little bit spotty. If you've looked at campus, huh? if you have seen, there's a big old uh, tower overlooking campus. If you're up on what we used to call Women's Hill, or Men's Hill, I don't know, the names have changed. Um, it had some sort of Swedish surgery. Uh, whatever it is, over there where a lot of the new housing is being built, you'll see that there's a giant tower right there. And you've got 4G access. You have cellular, so it's not nearly as sexy in a life room. Now you can get Verizon and Sprint pretty much the same. It is not necessary to have one of these as a college student. It may be necessary to survive as an 18-year-old, that I can't talk about. Okay? But it's not necessary for our program. Finally, one bit of technology I mentioned already, textbooks. Don't think of them as not technology because you can't plug them in. This is the most important technology you'll have, and it's 15th century, at least in the Western sense. Okay? You will need to plan for the cost of textbooks. Average per year is about $1,200, okay? and it does go up every single year. That includes all materials, okay? not just the books themselves. Know that there are options. You can buy from the bookstore, you will know that you get the right thing. You can also rent from the bookstore, which is probably about the cheapest option out there. They usually have all the books that you would need on rental as well as for purchase. If you go online,
prices from the bookstore for used. It means that you have to do more of the work, obviously, but if you're willing to do that for savings, you'll probably be able to find them. Um, certainly for used, the bookstore sort of has a, their used books are certainly available, make it less expensive. You probably find more used online. There's a little bit of a, a, a danger in that. You don't know you get exactly the right edition, but for the most part, you still do online. You've got lots of options. My advice, first time around, use the bookstore. Know what the standard is, and then if you decide you want to do something else, you can. It means it's more work on you instead of right here. Also, if you have a financial aid package that includes a bookstore voucher, you can't use it at Barnes & Noble. Okay? You can only use it here, so make use of it there. 
does it well, AP credit is usually given, or credit is usually given at Mars Hill for AP scores of three and up. Most AP scores, though, don't come in until the summer. If that happens, we make the change to the gateway. So it may be that the schedule that you have, because of information that comes in subsequently, requires a change. Happens. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Enrollment's good, yeah. It has to be a regionally accredited uh, uh, institution, but yes, we do it quite frequently. Any other questions? Yes, we do refer to one another as Dr. Pearson Hall. It's weird. Uh, anything else? <laughs> All right, last chance. All right, now don't get up yet. You don't know where you're going? Well, you probably do, but hold on. Okay, because you had it earlier. Registration room and challenges. We're gonna not just say everyone go, because if that happens, becomes a mess. Okay, so we're going to do it room by room. First room, Renfro 307, Carter and Trey. Raise your hands up there. If you have Renfro 307, stand up, go 